Now I intend to go through some of the main macro lenses uh, one by one and it could be pretty darn boring so hopefully you watch this once and uh, you know learn what you're looking for. I'll start out with my favorite macro lens the Voigtlander 125 f 2.5 macro APO Lanther. Now this is just the in my opinion the very best all-around macro lens that I own. There are other lenses that are faster and sharper but there's no other lens that I know of that has all of the good qualities that this particular lens has and they're very hard to find and they're very expensive like three grand. Now the the pros of this lens is that it's very very fast it's quite to very sharp it has nine aperture blades its focus is very close uh, like 14 inches 15 inches it goes to one to one and it has a very long focus throws as far as what cons it's there's nothing wrong with this lens it's perhaps a little heavy but that's it I probably could write a short book about this lens but I'm gonna spare you that the CV 125 is what I call it it's hands down the best macro lens I own and I use it just all the time even though I have a shelf full of some of the best macro lenses in the world at the ready as mentioned it has no major negatives it's it's super fast very sharp focuses close reproduce is to one to one has nine blades and so forth the works great bokeh you know incredible bokeh if I'm as I mentioned if I want to complain about it, it's a little heavy but I'm always happy to carry this piece of glass into the field the lens however is very difficult to find in the Nikon format it's also made for Canon Minolta and some other formats and as mentioned very expensive um, despite all of the good qualities probably the feature features that set this lens apart from other fine macro lenses are the fact that it's truly apochromatic uh, it's really been uh, has aberrations and so forth removed and highly corrected and it has such exceptional bokeh you know that lovely out of focus blur in the background of course in my opinion I would add that it has a quote magic unquote quality that words can't quite express and a very long focus throw that makes macros and stack photos so very easy for me I find this a stable camera when it comes to handling various types of light in the same frame like you know a woodland dark scene with shades of rays of sunlight coming down some lenses can't handle that very well they kind of blow out a bit But anyway this is a real workhorse of a lens and I've used mine day in and day out for years it focuses one to one so that it also lets you get very close in on your subjects a feature not often mentioned about this lens is that it's um, very sharp at mid-range and even landscape distances so this is the little lens that could and it does if you ever find one and have the money buy it certainly you'll never be sorry one one thing that has been pointed out about this lens that is not so great but I've never really come across it is that it's fairly delicately made inside it's not the strongest internal constru constructions I have a number of these lenses they all work fine I had one of them have the helicoid tightened up and that's about it and I've used it endlessly for years now now let's look at the Zeiss 50 millimeter f2 ZF um, macro planer this is you know just a wonderful little lens uh, it's even more interesting to me than this big brother the hundred millimeter macro planer that gets a lot of the credit and it's also a great lens the 50 millimeter is very very sharp and uh, has a with such a close focus you can treat it like a wide angle lens and poke it right down into the middle of things it stacks very well and it has a luxurious 300 degree focus throw it does not reach one to one but rather one to two but I don't really care because I don't use it for the nitty-gritty ultra close-up shots I treat it 
as mentioned above, more like a wide angle lens and reserve it for, for that. And to me, it's the best wide angle type lens that I've got, uh, except for the Leica 60 millimeter macro. This lens has a superb build. And if there's any fault at all with this lens, in my opinion, it's that it may be perhaps too contrasty like many of the Zeiss lenses and not color corrected enough for me. It's not quite subtle enough in color. It's just too contrasty. So in other words, it's not an APO lens and that's the only thing that I've noticed about it that I do not love. Um, you know, it's got all the other qualities, including nine aperture blades. Let's look at the Micro Nikkor 45mm f2.8 PCE tilt shift lens. Um, now I have all three of the more recent Nikon PC tilt shift lenses. I, this one plus the 85mm and the 24mm PC lenses. While all three of these lenses are exemplary, I find that the 45mm PC is for me at least the most useful for macro and close-up work. PC stands for perspective control uh, through the use of uh, tilt and shift features. I'm only going to say this once but this goes for the other two lenses when you get to that. The tilt features allows the lens to tilt either up and down or right and left a total of 8.5 degrees. There are many tutorials on the web for learning to use this feature, but the idea simply is that in any photo, there's one and only one plane of focus. Tilt allows the lens to align the plane of the lens with that of the image plane. An, an example might be a field of flowers stretching toward the horizon. Instead of just having the flowers in front in focus, by tilting the lens, the lens can, it can be possible to have the whole field more or less in focus. So that's a powerful feature, but it's a kind of a difficult one to learn to use, so be warned. Now the shift feature is immediately useful to anyone. It allows the lens to be shifted right or left or up or down, bringing what normally would be out of the frame uh, image into the frame without having to move the camera and using the same image circle. You can notice that these lenses have a large box-like midsection. This allows the lens to have a very large image circle, at least larger than a normal lens, so that shifting the lens to either side allows more or less of the subject to come into view and it offers a total shift of 11.5 millimeters. Uh, however, anything beyond about half of that, you, you may get some vignetting, so watch out. In addition, the whole lens barrel can be rotated plus or, minus, um, plus or minus 90 degrees by 30 degree increments, allowing you to combine tilt shift features in various combinations sounds amazing right it is but I don't suggest you run out and buy one unless you really need these features these lenses are bulky and heavy both the tilt and the shift features and especially the tilt feature have a rather steep learning curve and they're not exactly easy to learn the focus throw is very smooth but also very very short making it not ideal for close-up focus stacking. You really want to use it on a rail. That being said, the Nikon 45mm PCE lens is a lens that I frequently carry with me, uh, particularly for wider views than my CV125 Voigtlander lens will, uh, will allow me. Using this lens, I can stick it very close into a flower and capture it and the surrounding space easy, easily. So it really is a kind of a wide angle macro lens. And the shift feature allows me to take three photos, left, middle, and right, and then combine them uh, with a stitching program to produce a seamless mini panorama. Since all three of the photos already share a common image circle within the camera, this guarantees a seamless panorama. 
As mentioned though, I find that I can only shift left to right one half of the permitted distance without causing some vignetting. Still, I can produ produce a three shot panorama with no special panoramic head in a jiffy and they're excellent. I don't feel that these lenses are as perfect for stacked three shots panoramas as using the CV125 and a, a real pano head. So the good points are that this is a fast lens. It has nine blades, aperture blades. It's very sharp and it's good in close focus. But the bad points are that it has a terribly short uh, focus through 120 degrees. It's just awful. It does not go to one to one. Uh, and that the tilt and shift features require a learning curve. Uh, now let's look at the uh, Nikkor 24 millimeter PCE f3.5 tilt and shift lens. Pretty much everything that I said about the previous 45 millimeter lens is also true of the 24, so I won't repeat all that. Um, now the 24 millimeter PCE lens is a lens that I don't frequently carry with me for wider views than my CV125 requires. I tend to favor the 45 millimeter PCE lens um, and using the PC24, I can stick it very close to a flower and capture the flower and the surrounding space easily. The shift feature allows me to take three photos, left, middle, and right, as mentioned above, and combine them in, with a stitching program to produce a seamless mini panorama. So I mostly use the PC24 um, for landscape shots that are stacked where I use shift, taking three photos and then combining them into a single one. For that, it's just great. Although none of the PCE lenses are really quite sharp enough for me. And again, the same comments go for the Micro Nikkor 85 millimeter f2.8 PC tilt shift lens. Um, this is a, a really, it's a macro lens. It's a wonderful lens. It's indeed very, very sharp and may interest some of you. That being said, um, this is a lens that I don't frequently carry mainly because I have a number of great macro lenses in the 90 to the 125 millimeter focal range in particular the Voigtlander 125. Tilt and shift are not things I tend to do very close up although they can be useful on occasion. If I am shooting landscape or even mini landscape I generally go wider than 85 degrees so that's the, that's that thought. Now let's look at the Zeiss 100 millimeter F2 ZF um, macro planer. This is a, a wonderful macro lens. And like its little brother, the 50 millimeter macro planer, it's very, very sharp. The build is strong, you know, beautifully made, elegant. Um, I just wish its near focus distance was a little shorter. Um, 16.8 inches, not terrible, but I wish it could, and it also does not go one-to-one, -one, which is uh, maybe its main fault. It, but, it, you know, this is a legendary lens, and it has uh, fanatical followers. As for my use of it, in my opinion, like many Zeiss lenses, there's just a little too much contrast in the output and the colors are not corrected enough. They're not really true APO. It's not an APO lens. So it seems to lack, for me, some of the subtlety found in APO lenses like the CV125, Lanther, the Leica 100 millimeter APO, and the Coastal Optic 60 millimeter APO. Aside from that, it's a wonderful lens. It has a, a it's fast, sharp, with a good focus throw, uh, 360 degrees in a nine blade aperture. Now let's look at the uh, Micro Nikkor 60 millimeter f.2 G uh, macro lens. This is the newer uh, newer Micro Nikkor 60 millimeter. Now this is a real workhorse of a macro lens, especially for copy work. I shot over 30,000 images 
of concert rock posters with this lens, early, with its, you know, the earlier version. And it worked better than any other lens I could put my hands on. If I had had the Coastal Optic 60 millimeter at that time, perhaps only that would have been a better copy lens. The 60 millimeter Nikon macro is not what the 105 millimeter focal range can provide. Um, and most macro photographers want that extra distance between themselves and their subjects. A 60 millimeter does not provide that. And I, I never use it for ultra close work uh, that 100 millimeter or 200 millimeter macro lenses provide. Instead, 60 millimeter macros are for larger subjects, what I call uh, dioramas or mini landscapes, uh, such as a close up of a flower and as much of the context or bush or leaves surrounding it uh, that I can get into the same frame. It's a great lens for that. And if, if you're thinking of, uh, however, looking at the I have a dragonfly or the bee's knees. This is, lens is not for that. But the more I learn about close-up photography, the more that 60 millimeter focal lens is becoming useful to me. This lens is all about context, uh, telling a story with the, with the shot. Wider angle lenses allow us to tell more of a story than do the longer focal length, at least for me. However, it has a huge disadvantage in that the 120 degree focus throw is just way too short to do stacking. So, and coupled with the fact that it's 60 millimeters, it's a little wide, it makes focusing you know, a real problem, especially if you want to stack. Um, now the one-to-one -one image frame is a good, a good thing, a real plus, and it makes the lens very attractive. But basically, um, it's the focus throw that kills the deal here, unless you want to mount it on a, on a focus rail. I wouldn't be without this lens. This is one of the very best macro lenses that I own, except for the things that I pointed out. So if you want to stick it on a rail, go ahead, and it's also inexpensive relatively, so just get one. I, I think it's a great lens. The Nikkor 35 millimeter F 1.4G, this fairly new, and quite expensive lens is very, very sharp. And although it may have been designed for, for people as a walking around lens, it also makes a very good wide angle close up lens for macro shooters because it has a close focus near distance of less than 10 inches. So you can poke this little baby right in the midst of a bunch of flowers and get one very close shot and also see everything else in the vicinity at the same time. There has been some discussion about autofocus not being exact on this lens, but as a macro shooter, that I could care less because I shoot with manual focus anyway. And so uh, uh, one thing I am sorry about is that the focus throw is so darn short. 90 degrees for a focus throw is horrible, so you really have to mount this lens on a focus rail if you're going to do anything very serious with it. As a wide angle lens, it does not go to one to one. Uh, and I must say there are other older Nikon wide angle lenses, that 35 millimeter and 28 millimeter, that also do a superb job at a much lower cost, so don't ignore those. But for my work, this is kind of a magic lens, and it's very useful for many landscapes dioramas and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's also a great walk around lens uh, for parties and people. It's very fast, very sharp, has nine aperture blades um, and a short focus, 9.85 inches, which is great. Bad points are it has a very short focus throw, no one-to-one -one, and it's kind of heavy. The Coastal Optic 60 millimeter F four APO macro lens. Aside from being very expensive, like $4,500, the CO60 APO lens is somewhat of a specialized lens. It, it, it's designed for use not only in the visual spectrum, but also in the infrared and ultraviolet spectrums, you know, those that are on either side of the visual spectrum. 
Originally, I believe it was designed for forensic and scientific use. And if you're looking for a copy camera lens for a studio, this would be just about perfect. Lens expert Lloyd Chambers states that the CO 60 millimeter is, and I quote, a reference lens for other lenses. On a scale of one to five, it's a five plus, end quote. That being said, for me, it does have its problems. Foremost among them is the fact that this lens has a prominent hot spot at smaller apertures around magnifications of one to three reproduction ratio. For distances longer than that, there's not a problem. However, as a macro photographer, the one to three range means I have to run into these hot spots all the time and they completely ruin a photo. So I'm not sure what the thinking is on why such an expensive and perfect lens should have such a glaring fault. Perhaps it is that we should just be grateful that it's as fantastic as it is within the limits, warts and all. And one, one workaround is to use the very smallest extension ring to help you bypass that hotspot range. Another trick is to use um, a higher megapixel camera like the Nikon D3X or D800 and avoid the hotspot range and just crop out what you're trying to capture. That might be the easiest way because uh, they have that, that those extra pixels. I've done both of these successfully. Now aside from the hotspot, I have other issues with this lens. In particular, the very, very short focus throw of around 210 degrees. I just can't imagine why they would make such an important macro lens have no focus throw, so that you really have to use it on a rail. Compared to 630 degrees for the Cosina Voigtlander 125, 210 degrees is difficult, especially since with a focal length of 60 millimeters, that's wide enough that even the smallest change in the focusing barrel produces a notable output change. It makes it hard to focus stack with this, you know, this lens. So macro lenses benefit from having long focus throws especially if they're, it's a wide angle lens. The other issue that I've encountered, although no one else seems to have ever mentioned it or worry about it, is that I find that when shooting in mixed light, such as in the shadows of a forest canopy where maybe a, a single shaft of sunlight is cutting through the shade, the 60 millimeter uh, coastal optics appears to be very sensitive to light dynamics. And the result is the need to use diffusers very carefully to filter, you know, these brighter areas. That being said, this is a sharp, sharp, wonderful lens indeed. It comes with no hood, but it absolutely needs a hood. So I would suggest those who want a hood get the Nikon HR2. That's what I did for my copy. So we've got a wickedly sharp, short focus lens, uh, but it's slow, f4 has only seven blades with a short focus throw, does not go to one to one, and worst of all, has a hot spot at a key place, one to three reproduction ratio. The Voigtlander 58 millimeter F1.4 Noctan. This lens is an all metal construction uh, with a hard rubber focusing ring. The included lens cap is a pain and should not even be used because it requires you to remove the screw-in hood each time you use it, which is like not acceptable. So anyway, I just simply bought a Nikon 52 millimeter pinch cap and that solved the problem. And I intend to find a rubber 52 millimeter hood and get rid of the original metal dome. No less an authority than Lloyd Chambers states that this lens is equal to the Zeiss 50 millimeter F1.4 macro planar and better than the holy grail of Nikons, which is the legendary Noct Nikkor 58 millimeter F1.2. Now that's, that is saying a lot. I don't happen to have the Noct Nikkor, but test results by others show that this lens, the Noctan, 
uh, is not great wide open, but very strong from f4 or f5.6, and even stronger at f8 and very fine at f11. This is kind of unusual and makes the Nocton perfect for close-up nature photography, but maybe not for stacking, uh, where we want to use a lower, you know, wider aperture. It's also one of the least expensive top quality lenses available today. And in summary, it's very fast, very sharp, and it has nine blades. And not so good, it's, it doesn't have a very close focus. No one-to-one, -one. and f16 is the narrowest aperture. The Nikon 16 millimeter f2.8 fisheye and also the f3.5, an earlier version. It's a rectilinear fisheye. Now this to me is a really fun lens. Um, in a way the Nikon uh, 16 millimeter fisheye lens is the opposite of a macro lens, which oddly makes it useful to me in my work as an antidote for what I normally do. Instead of getting close up, this rectilinear, so that it's that simply means it's framed like any other lens rather than a circular spherical fisheye. It's able to cram almost the entire world into the shot, including my feet and too often the tripod itself. Now, thanks to special software in post-production, I use the built-in features of Adobe Lightroom, but there are others. The resulting photos can be more or less straightened out to appear as a normal photo but one maybe that we took on LSD. For myself, I love this lens and it's small enough and light enough to jam into a pocket or a bag. With a near focal, focus distance of something like 10 inches, I can highlight a single flower close up and have the whole meadow in which it sits looking over its shoulder. Although this, this lens is relatively sharp, it's not really sharp enough to be totally convincing but that's really not its purpose. I love the 3D or otherworldly sense that this lens offers, and I have sought to replicate this effect, but with deeper focus by using a panoramic head and focus stacking with maybe a little success. It took me years to succumb to owning this lens, because why would I want a fisheye? But that was a big mistake on my part. The 16 millimeter rectilinear fisheye is a lens I would not part with, there's an earlier version that's even sharper, that's uh, as f3.5. So the legendary Leica 100 millimeter APO macro Elmarit R lens at f2.8. Now this is a great macro lens. It's a true APO, it's a true apochromatic lens at 100 millimeter, which is just one of the favored macro focal lengths and the focus throw is a huge 710 degrees. You can just turn and turn this little baby and get very, very, very fine increments of focus. Uh, it's just what a focus stacker like myself is looking for, you know, truly incremental focus without a rail. This lens was never made for the Nikon mount, so if you find one and you want it on a Nikon, you're gonna have to make the conversion yourself, which is exactly what I did. Not only is this one of the sharpest macro lenses ever made, but it has almost a, a movie-like uh, feel to it, to the color, very soft and delicate. Now it doesn't go to one to one, but only to one to two, so that's not so great. Although it comes with the Alpro diopter close-up lens that can be purchased with, with it, which actually brings it to one to one. However, as a rule, I don't like close-up adapters, although this is probably maybe an exception. This might be the best one I've ever seen. But there is some bad news with this lens on an Icon camera, although not impossible. There's just no way that you can enable the ability of this lens on an Icon to automatically open up when you use the, v the viewfinder to focus and then stop down at the appropriate aperture when the shot's taken. It just doesn't do that. It can't be done because what is needed is a mechanical lever, lever that's just not present. So what this means is a chore, is that for every shot, you have to manually turn the aperture ring wide open, focus, 
and then look and see, and then turn the aperture back down to where you want it for the exposure. This pr procedure, you know, remembering to uh, to stop down before you shoot the photograph and get it overexposed is an acquired taste, one that I've barely learned. So the bottom line here is that this is one of the great lenses of all time, but I seldom choose it when I have other lenses that will let me see to focus at the widest aperture in the viewfinder. And then when I take the photo, it will automatically stop down for the exposure itself. This lens is outstanding. It's a class act. And it even comes in a little form-fitting leather case that zips it up. So the quick review, this is a fast lens, seven blades for the aperture, reasonably short focus, great focus throw, and just wonderful color. The bad news is it does not go to one-to-one -one without help. Uh, and worst thing is it has no automatic aperture. You have to open, focus, close to shoot. When it comes to focus stacking, when you do 50 or 100 of those, you just don't do that. Uh, or you try to pick a subject where you don't have to see it again. You just increment on through. But that's the downside of, the, of this very wonderful lens. Now, the like like a 100 millimeter APO macro Amarit R lens comes with a close-up attachment called the Alpro, which takes the lens from a reproduction ratio of 1.2 to 1.1. Um, now this is an add-on, you know, I kind of hate add-ons, but uh, since this is one of the legendary macro lenses, you know, a true APO apochromatic lens, it's worth having this little Alpro. So although I don't like adding anything onto a lens, this particular little close-up attachment was specifically made for this specific lens, and it, it actually works well. So I hold my nose and use it, but I think that uh, I can't see anything wrong with it, uh, so I, I do recommend it.